So last time I saw our next speaker, he had cooked an entire pig, invited a lot of people around, he fed it to us, he recorded us while we ate it, and then he turned it into an electronic album, and it was really good. Um, Matthew Herbert is probably one of the most original and sophisticated composer and producers working in music today, and he thinks a lot about what sound is and how we might use it in different ways. So, Matthew. Um, thank you. Um, I'm not used to standing at these things. You can sit down. Things, so I'll start standing and see how I get off. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, the interesting thing about sound really is that we've only had sound 100 years, really. Um, yeah. which is, We've had the recorded image uh, for 4 million years, or how long we've been painting on caves. Um, but record, in terms of recorded sound, we've had it for 100 years, 120 years. And really, for the majority of that time, we have... Uh, recorded each other speaking and playing instruments. We haven't really recorded sound. For example, there's nowhere to listen to 1982. Or if you want to listen to Belgium, there's nowhere to go. Or if, you want to listen, if you're thinking of moving to Bristol and you want to hear what Bristol's uh, high street sounds like on a Saturday night, there's nowhere to go. And so uh, it seems a curious, a curious hole, and I think that... I sort of, uh, it's interesting hearing about how complex the art of uh, the act of listening is, because I, I do think that we're we we act like we're very clumsy listeners. A, a good example for me is this bloody fan behind us, which is this screen here. And designers thought about everything, but they haven't once thought about this, the loudness of the fan. And it's a very loud sound, and it's got conflicting tones in it that's driving me nuts over here. <laughs> And uh, I was at the BBC yesterday, and they had this very elaborate screen showing all these things going across, of words scrolling. And then they must have had 20 fans behind the thing, cooling this thing. So as you walk past, it was like a horrible, dissonant chorus of mechanical... <laughs> and uh, one last example was I was in the... I sound like a, I'm doing the rounds of the medium, but I, but, uh, I was in the Channel 4 canteen the other day, and they had, uh, they had a coffee stall. It was bigger than this. The, ca the canteen's bigger than this. A coffee stall over here and sort of catering at the other end. And I was sort of in the middle but closer to there. And the fridge was like at least 10 decibels louder than the, than the music. And yet there was an automatic assumption by everybody present, including my brain and including presumably the people that put the music on, that that music was somehow a... Uh, that would somehow take priority over that, that our brain would be attuned to it, and of course it is in some ways. And I think that in 100 years' time, we'll look back at, and think this is the dark ages. I read a book uh, recently that said that the average conversation has got 10 decibels louder in the last 10 years. So we're getting louder just to compete with all this noise around us. If you, if you think about walking down a street, everything is organised according to how it looks. So the shape of the windows, where the signposts are, the width of the pavement, where the trees might be planted. In terms of planning, how much planning has there been about the sound of this? At minimal, 1% at best, if you're lucky. So we're living in a very ugly, cacophonous mess. And, uh, and so I do think that, in many ways, this is an interesting time to be talking about sound. I'm getting asked more and more to speak at these things because there's a, a sort of a dawning realisation that we're actually at the frontier of something. I think this can be particularly be seen in music, which is, for the last four million years, music has been Impressionism. If I wanted to write a piece of music about this room or about a pig, I would have had to try and imitate the quality of this room somehow, maybe the geometry of it or the timbre or the texture of it, or try and talk about, uh, uh, try and musically describe the emotional response I had to the room. And uh, whereas now, with the invention of the microphone, the tape machine, and the sampler and the computer, I can now take an actual recording of this room and turn it into music. And so there's a fundamental shift in what the, uh, the very idea of music is, which is it used to be about something, and now it is that something. So suddenly, we're writing documentaries. So in, uh, I wrote a piece of music which was... Um, uh, I wrote to somebody in Palestine and I asked them to send them some sounds over to me and to send their most favourite sounds and their most hated sounds. 
and the most favourite sounds were people working in the fields and the rhythm. And rather predictably in retrospect, but I wasn't expecting it to be like this, but all the, uh, all the most hated sounds were the sounds of the occupation and tanks destroying houses and things. And one of these sounds was uh, uh, Palestinians and international protesters being shot against the wall at Ramallah by Israeli Defence Force. And I rather naively set out on this journey in, in some respects. But, uh, but there I was in the studio. Suddenly I had the sound of somebody being shot, somebody I'd never met. I don't know who was being shot, who was doing the shooting. I don't know any of the context about any of this. Uh, I don't know if anybody was right, if anybody was wrong. Suddenly I'm, there's a, a political dimension to what I'm doing. There's a moral dimension. Suddenly I have a moral responsibility to this. I have a, a whole a different philosophical relationship to this than a piano. If I just sit down at a piano, I'm trying to conjure something from midair. Whereas now, suddenly I'm telling a story, and it's not, in this instance, it's not my story, and it's a story that I don't know, I'm not even necessarily authorized to tell other than by the person who recorded it and sent it to me. And so, for me, that's the absolute front line of music right now, is the morality of, of sound. So, for example, the last four million years, vast amounts of music have been basically about life and death, about thinking about the afterlife, thinking about our own mortality. And yet now we can record the actual thing. So I have a recording, for example, of one of the Twin Towers collapsing. I was in Manhattan on the roof uh, of my hotel. Um, had a gig that night and happened to be recording all the sirens and all the noises and the sound of the towers collapsing in the background. I haven't done anything with it yet, but I. Whenever I talk about using it, there's a sharp intake of breath, a, a sort of sense of like, what, what, are you, what, can, what are you doing with that? You know, how, how can you use that? And it's interesting that people don't have that same response to a video or a photograph. No one says, oh, you can't print a photograph of that in the newspaper. They don't say, oh, you can't show a video. And I understand that music feels different. And that's what's interesting to me. Why does it feel different? Why does organizing sound into this way in music, why does that have a different have a different effect, and I don't have the answers, but I think that's, for me, what feels an exciting time to be working with sound right now. And, uh, and then moving that outwards uh, a little bit, uh, one of my new jobs is uh, I'm the director of the newly reformed Radiophonic Workshop. Um, for those that don't know, the BBC Radiophonic Workshop started in 1958 and uh, was the closest thing that Britain's ha ever had to um, a visible electronic experimental uh, rec uh, studio. Uh, it was known particularly for the contribution of the women, Delia Derbyshire and Daphne Oram, amongst others, and uh, produced its most famous offering was um, the Doctor Who sound, uh, sound uh, theme tune. And uh, they were very much interested in synthesis, and they built all these machines from scratch, machines that you can trace the DNA to a lot of equipment that we use now. And, uh, and what's interesting really is that, sort of fast forward to 2012, this, the, the Radiophonic Workshop closed 20 years ago. So it's been reopened recently. And my, sort of, my suggestion is, well, now what? You know, when they were started working, they were thinking about the future, thinking about what's, what crazy sounds could they get from the future. And the way they did that was trying to create synthesizers or machines that would generate those sounds on our behalf. And my sort of supposition really now, or my proposition, I should say, is really that we're sort of in the future now. You know, I can write a piece of music by stroking a little piece of glass and send it to Moscow in 10 seconds. So we're sort of there. Now what? And for me, in a way, that idea of machines making music or that sort of synthetic element, that's less relevant than it probably was a few years ago. And the challenge is about sound. What do we do with that sound? So um, the reason I been in Channel 4's cafe and the BBC and things and starting to talk to institutions and thinking about the idea of institutions as musical instruments and that what they produce should be harmonious and should be in sync and they should be aware of the things that they broadcast, not just their visual image but also the sounds that they make. So for example, walking into the BBC and hearing the ridiculous fans that come out there immediately creates something and does something to you in a way that, that as I say, in a few years' time um, we'll be pretty shocked about. And I think, uh, just to finish up, 
Uh, for me, um, one of the members of the Radiophonic Workshop has invented uh, something which I think is the future of sound and is a very interesting, from a design point of view, I think is an extremely important and interesting uh, development. Uh, and it's a program called Chirp, which there's a possibility that some people might know. It's an iPhone uh, app, but it will be an Android app shortly. And uh, so it's just a little, it's, it's listening basically at any, at any point. You can take a picture, at, this, at the moment it's a, an app for taking photographs and sharing photos, but it's just a way of demonstrating its capacity. But uh, if anybody has this app and they open it, if I, um, there's a picture that I, I previously took, and where's my microphone? <laughs> so if anybody has that app open, they'd have received that photograph. So it's a way of transmitting data through sound. So if anybody uh, has this app and they also had a microphone, they could, they would just receive that. And what is interesting about this, it, it goes over what they call dumb networks. So for example, in this instance, I could broadcast it through a PA. So it's not like Bluetooth where I have to form a relationship with you and pair up with you and accept. It's not like email or Twitter where I have to find your handle and locate you. If you can hear it, you can get it. And I think this is revolutionary in design-wise. Uh, design you can imagine, um, you can imagine um, a car pulling up to a petrol station and broadcasting to the pump exactly how much petrol it needs to be put into it. Or, or, you, can, uh, or you can imagine a broadcaster uh, broadcasting uh, the, uh, so it's a documentary, it could be backup notes to something, could come out of the, telephone, um, out of the television with you. So if you happen to be listening with Chirp, uh, you would, you'd receive that. Um, I think that uh, I think that'd be interesting in fiction. You can start to have a different relationship across across what are previously blank blank screens. So for me, it feels like this has just come out in the last six weeks. And for me, it, it feel, as I said, it feels like a very good time to be thinking about sound and about sound design because I think it holds unlocks the key to the next big uh, revolution in human communications. Thank you. Thank you.